here about two months ago. I have a short uh, five minutes talk about has announcement that yeah, iHealth is coming to Singapore. And now I got a new title, like uh, <laughs> this one, CEO of Singapore. I was a CTO of, uh, oh, I I'm currently have two titles. And not alone, I'm not coming alone. Actually, a whole team coming from California, they are here today, like Mark, Chris, uh, Jason, Annie, and a lot of people coming from California. Uh, we are here to set up the company iHealth Singapore. So that's uh, uh, dreams come true. And uh, I'll spend some time to talk about why we're here and uh, uh, what do we do and uh, what technology stack we are using and why we're using this technology stack. Like we're using like React, Redux, uh, GraphQL, Docker, a lot of new stuff, kind of fancy stuff. And uh, my team member, Jason Chris, will talk about some detail about uh, why, we need, why we need to use that. So I'm talking about why we're here. So uh, I've, I've been in the internet industry for a long time, starting from 1995. I believe some of the uh, members here maybe were not born at that year. <laughs> and that is the year JavaScript was invented, a long time ago. I can see a lot of a change during the f 21 years, a lot of change. A lot of industry actually changed a lot. For example, we buy things from uh, Amazon. We call taxi, now Uber. And uh, we, we, uh, we don't have an international, international phone call. We just use uh, WhatsApp. A lot of things we changed. And every industry, as long as it was changed by internet, it can reduce the cost a lot. We can, we can see the international phone call, for example. Usually, I remember 20 years ago when I called my, my friends overseas, that cost a lot. But now I can actually call my wife every day. She's in California with zero, zero cost. Because every time internet goes to some industry, it changes a lot. Everybody agree. But there is one huge industry in the world. A huge, not small. Huge, much, much bigger than like a long online shopping, uh, bigger than tax industry, but still not significantly changed by internet. This is healthcare. I got a picture today uh, since 1995 to uh, two years ago. Um, the GDP, the, the healthcare cost on G, about a percentage on GDP. So it's, a, it's increased a lot, not decreased. And you can see I got two countries like USA and Singapore say, like USA now, uh, two years ago, the cost of healthcare is about 17% of the GDP. Singapore is less, uh, 5% about, but Singapore increased a lot, more than US. Um, yeah, but uh, the abs absolute value is lower. Maybe Singapore government should spend more money <laughs> to the Singaporeans. Uh, or Singapore people is more healthy than, than, than US people. <laughs> <laughs> so this industry didn't change a lot. But based on my understanding, the internet changed so fast. Nowadays, the healthcare industry shoots something like this. All modern technology, very cool. But unfortunately, the reality is this. We're running late. So I'm not sure in Singapore, but uh, in the US, I'm not, I'm not very surprised if you go to the, some ho uh, hospital or doctor clinic, I can see the doctor still using Windows XP with IE6. I'm not surprised at all because it's reality. They are very slow. And also, this is an opportunity for everybody in this room. So this is an industry currently is under disruption. Very quick, very fast. That's why we are here. So I have actually a company, I I, last time I have a very quick in the, in interaction, but uh, now I'm not going to spend too much time because uh, today is a, is a tech talk. I just say uh, why we were here. What we do is we have the uh, hardware, software, and uh, 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 service to provide to the healthcare industry. And uh, we actually uh, starting uh, six years ago in Silicon Valley. Uh, this is uh, a picture I got from the famous TV show. I like the show very much. Did you ever see that? Yes, yeah, pretty interesting. And we grew so fast. Um, two years ago, three years ago, we started ha have a Paris company. And uh, last year, China. And uh, this year, actually two weeks ago, we have a Singapore company now. We are very new. And what we do is uh, we ac actually we combine the hardware, software, and the service together. We provide, currently we have a project in Singapore. And that's why we are here. We set up a team here. And we're currently growing very fast. 
So I'm talking about why we choose, uh, OK, I'm going to go this way. What is the difficulty we are currently facing is, um, no matter what kind of industry you're looking at, you always a balance between uh, product is quality is good, how fast you can develop it, and uh, the cost. So always there is a balance. So in this industry, the particular is how we can save the cost, but also make things fast. I can give you an example. One of my, uh, maybe all the clients, not only one of them. They actually they want to spend three years talking about uh, do we need to do this or do we want to do that and what are we supposed to do. And uh, once they decide to do, they just give us three months to finish it. Right? <laughs> Very common, right? Very common. But how we can make it fast? So that's why we're looking for some technology, some tech stack. We can do the very good balance between the three. So that's why we're thinking how we can do this as things modular, like building a house. We have the house building in the factory, and we assemble them together at the site. So that's the idea I come from. So what we couldn't be using is we're using this, this tech stack. So we use React and React Native at the front end, uh, web app and the mobile app. We use Redux as a user logic. And the GraphQL is uh, between the client side and server side doing query. And the Docker is our hosting. So after my quick talk, uh, Chris will be talking about the Docker and all the general Node.js hosting. And the Jason will come and talk about the GraphQL. I believe uh, you're already very familiar about the React and React Native or Redux. So we, we're just going to skip the first two, uh, about the second, uh, the third, and the fourth today to save some time. So the reason we choose them is um, we want the, uh, the software building is like the modular house. We have a team, global team, uh, headquartered in the US. We built the modules using like a React, React Native. We do, uh, use a React, Redux. We build the module, modules. And the modules will be used in different country, Singapore, for example. We have a local engineer just hook them up together to based on the customer needs. So in this case, we can reduce the cost and make building the application super fast. And those technology stack is uh, based on our research is the best so far. So we can make software very really fast. That's the reason uh, we choose that. And uh, I believe uh, those two guys can give you more introduction. Uh, I will leave more time for them. So I just want to make, make sure that we are uh, can create hiring people now. Uh, that's why we are here. We are looking for the talent from uh, Singapore to join us. And uh, I believe you are one of the kind. So after the talk, uh, our team member will be there in the corner. So if you want to talk to us, just come to us. We really hope to know you and uh, have a chance to work together. So this is my email, and uh, I'll be here after the talk. OK, so next will be Chris. Chris is talking about uh, the general uh, Node.js hosting. Come on. I can have this. OK. All right. This is good. Everyone hear me? All right, cool. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm going to talk about JavaScript hosting, um, easy uptime, and all that other good stuff. Uh, so I'm the ops guy. Um, I don't know if anyone here has to deal with like DevOps or anything like that, but I usually go between two states of either being really bored or having my whole life on fire. Um, so I try to keep my life not on fire as much as I can. So. Uh, that brings us to Docker. I'm a huge fan of Docker. Um, I don't know if anyone here has used Docker, or I'm not sure if anyone here like provides. Oh yeah, good. Uh, Docker is like my favorite thing ever. Um, I'm not sure if anyone here has to provide their own hosting, or if you use things like Node Chef or Heroku or things like that. Uh, however, since we're a health company, we have to own all of our data, so we have to provide all of our own infrastructure. Um, I'll, I'll get back to Docker in a second. Uh, so when I joined the company over a year ago, we were originally written in Meteor, and Meteor is actually one of my favorite uh, JavaScript frameworks. Um, and actually, Evan Yu used to work for Meteor back in like a while ago. Um, but Meteor is really cool because it allows you to like do easy microservices, which is really like the hot topic nowadays because they have DDP, which stands for uh, Distributed Data Protocol, so you can communicate between your web apps pretty effortlessly. Um, but the thing is, uh, Meteor has some 
problems when it comes to hosting. Uh, it requires sticky sessions, web sockets, um, and obviously, since we're a secure company, we have to have SSL. So all three of those things in combination with each other provide for some pretty tricky things, as well as like a lack of the ability to uh, scale horizontally with real ease. Um, so what we decided to do was move away from Meteor um, and go into GraphQL. Uh, and the cool thing about this is that we get to separate our client side and our server side code again, because if anyone here has ever written Meteor, you know that it pretty much gets bundled all together. Uh, you can wrap it around in CloudFront, serve the static assets through a CDN or anything like that. But for the most part, you get one executable. Um, so client and server uh, separated is a really good thing um, because you can take Webpack, which is what we use, uh, create a nice bundled JS, and then you can throw it up into an S3 bucket for some static uh, hosting. Uh, and when you do that, you get 99.99% uptime guaranteed, as well as 99.99's durability. So it's a pretty, it's a very good solution. It's a very easy solution. Um, and uh, that has been saving me a lot of time. Uh, and the reason being is that with, uh, since we have a lot of microservices running in the back, um, uh, Netflix has come out with something called Chaos Monkey. I don't know if anyone knows about it. Basically, it's the idea that uh, they built this themselves. We don't run it, but they built this thing that will turn off their servers uh, just randomly uh, throughout the day. And the point of it is that if any one of your services goes down, it shouldn't affect the user experience uh, on the front end. Um, and that's uh, something that we take uh, to heart because uh, health is a, or health tech is a very like important field and something that needs to have a very high uh, service like um, uptime. Uh, so we build all of our services with the idea that if any one of them goes down uh, by themselves, which is almost guaranteed to happen, uh, that it won't affect the user uh, at the end. Um, so that's the reason why. So Nginx and Docker is the best thing ever because all you have to do is run Nginx and then you can have, uh, we use console as a key value store in the back and that will work as our service uh, registry. So then as services get brought up and taken down, um, they automatically register with the console cluster and that console cluster will then in turn update our Nginx uh, config file. So that way, uh, if our front end servers go down, then they'll just reroute them to other front end services. Uh, if our back end servers go down, then they'll just get taken out there. Um, and Nginx and uh, microservices, uh, it's, really, it's really a solid uh, match made in heaven, if you ask me. Um, and the reason I know that is because right now I'm the only uh, ops guy and I'm able to manage it all by myself. Um, so it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, that's basically all I have. Uh, I like microservices. I like Docker. If you like microservices or Docker, any of the above, uh, feel free to talk to me. I'm willing to talk to anybody about it forever. So uh, that's all I got for you. Thanks. And now uh, Jason will be coming up now to talk about GraphQL. Oh, thanks. Where should I put it? I'm just plugging it in. Yeah. Okay. And then can I get a, some, like a clicker to? Uh, okay. I can talk about React after. You want to? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, I think you only have five minutes for your talk, though. I'll be fast. Uh, but he wanted to talk, though, after. Is that okay? Um, one of my coworkers wanted to also talk. Is that okay? No, no, not me, but him. Is that okay? Instead of, instead of you? No, 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 after me. Um, but can right. both of you talk within the five minute time limit? Probably not. <laughs> so maybe Sorry, not, Mark? I guess, I guess you yeah. Choose one. Um, Mark, I don't, I don't know if it's possible. Yeah. It, maybe I can go fast? Uh, okay, again. so I just click this? Uh, right. right. Okay. Okay. This is uh, a. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Jason. I am an engineer at iHealth. Um, I'm mostly. Okay. Um, I'm pretty versatile in front and back end. Right now, my responsibilities are on the server side and the GraphQL. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, GraphQL. I chose this topic because I think GraphQL is still something that's very new uh, in the world. Um, so, so yeah, OK. Hopefully, after I talk, uh, you guys have an understanding of what GraphQL is like. Um, and hopefully, when you see it, you can recognize it and stuff. OK, so an introduction to our current use case in our company. Um, today, we use GraphQL and Socket.io, React, and React Native to power our B2B enterprise applications. Um, a lot of our applications range from like uh, real-time communication apps, um, various Internet of Things apps. We have a lot of devices, like Kevin mentioned, um, Internet of IoT devices like blood pressure, blood glucose, pulse, pulse socks, uh, activity monitor. Uh, Etc. So we make, we make uh, IoT apps for all those devices that we sell uh, for our enterprise customers. Okay, so first, what is GraphQL? GraphQL is a query language. It's a type-based query language, meaning everything is driven by a type system. Like everything is a type of something, and everything resolves into another type, etc. Um, it's very easy to understand, and it's very easy to ex uh, know the expected result of the query that you're writing or looking at. Um, it's most frequently compared to a REST API uh, because it's just like the REST API. You, uh, you send post requests and you retrieve data. Um, so here is an example of a GraphQL query. Um, here on the left, you have your query. And on the right, you have the, expected, you have the result. Um, it, and it's pretty much like you can pretty much uh, look at this and know what you're going to get. Um, this is a query, these are the types that you're going to get, and if this is a type inside this type, and et cetera, and you can tell that first name, Jason, last name, Lee, and an address. It's very easy to understand. It's one of the main benefits of GraphQL. Sorry. Oops. OK, so if you look at the, how the schema is designed, you have the query very at the top, where it says it's get user return. Uh, it's a query that accepts a parameter of ID, and then it gives you the, the the user type. And then if you look at the user type, it's basically an ID, first name, last name, address, which is a, another type. And then an address is a type of this. And then a country is an e uh, enum enum type with the Singapore, U.S., and Canada as an option. Okay, so pretty easy to understand. OK, so first thing that you should know about GraphQL is that GraphQL is a map of relationships. It's not a map of your database or your data. Um, it's a map of relationships. Uh, for example, it's a friend of a get, get, a, get, a, um, get your profile and uh, your friend's profile and a friend of a friend, or uh, get, an, get an event and then get the creator of that event. <laughs> OK, so here's an example of a map of relationship. Here I'm getting a program, and I'm actually getting the creator, and I'm get actually getting the organization who hosted this uh, program, and then the representative from that organization. So that's what I mean by map of relationships. Uh, GraphQL is flexible. Um, for example, GraphQL has interface type, so you can, um, you can um, have uh, one data set and then like um, route them to different kind of data sets. Maybe, maybe if you have measurements data, maybe you want to go through blood pressure, and et cetera, et cetera. And then there's scalar types that you could take a value and then resolve into another value. A good example of that is a date. Um, because uh, instead of passing a, because, because you cannot pass like an object to a post request, because it has to be a string, so that you can take a scalar type and then um, resolve it into a timestamp, for example. Uh, here's an example. I'm getting all measurements. And under, so this query would return a measurement type. And the measurement type could be a blood pressure or a blood glucose. So that, um, the, these are the common fields that they both would have. And then if the measurement, uh, the list of measurement in the hat, in that, that row is actually a blood pressure, then it would go here. If it's blood glucose, it would go here. So, so uh, GraphQL is very flexible, as you can see. So if you're getting a list of two, here's a blood pressure, here's a glucose. Um, here's an example of a scalar. So I have an event, and I have a schedule, and then I have a repeat on what days it repeats. Uh, and then, and then um, on the, so how I did this one is basically on the server side, I use a bid mask, a bidwise uh, logic. And then uh, using the bid lo uh, bid my, bid, bidwise logic, I, which is a, just a regular integer, 
it gets converted into an array of days that I repeat this event, which is an example of a scalar type. So another benefit of uh, why we chose to use uh, GraphQL is because um, uh, it allows us to move fast, basically. Um, the front end, our front-end engineers don't have to wait for me because um, without me actually finishing the server side at the back end, uh, we can just mock everything. And then mocking literally takes uh, a few hours at most for the entire endpoint once we know all the endpoints. Um, so the front end engineers can um, work with the query even though I actually haven't actually finished it. Um, and the automatic documentation feature makes it very easy to understand the, the, the endpoints in the GraphQL API that I wrote so that the other engineers uh, can go through the documentation with the, which is automatically created to understand the, the API that they're going to use, for example. So here's the um, documentation explorer feature, of, which is part of graphical. So here is that at the very root, I have a query, mutation, a subscription, and then, and then you, go, you trickle down the list, and then you will find like uh, get user query returns a user type, and this is, this is what the user type um, returns. Um, so other reasons why we chose GraphQL is uh, it's, it's, um, it's very, the version control is not an issue. So in GraphQL, I can literally, sorry. Oh, and I'll do it back. Oh, okay, I think, sorry. Okay, so in GraphQL, um, I can change the backend however many times I want. Um, I can even change the database if I want. I can change the design of the database or any backend infrastructure and the front end won't be affected. The endpoints can stay the same and the, the engineers will never know that I made such a big change. Um, so again, so we wouldn't be stuck into an uh, ecosystem either uh, because of the, thanks to this uh, benefit. Um, so yeah. And the ability to duplicate, add, and update the API without uh, impacting the, my users, the API users. OK. Um, so, so far, um, if anyone here has played with GraphQL or even read about it, um, they may, you may have already like, um, known most of this. Because at the, at the end of it, um, GraphQL is actually a very simple, simple um, tool. Um, because um, in GraphQL, there's really only two main um, abstractions, which are resolvers and your schemas. Um, GraphQL has schemas that define how you query and the data you get. And the resolvers pretty much um, do your function so that that tells you how you resolve your queries. right? So most people know that about GraphQL. But um, GraphQL is actually, there's a lot more to it. So to really use GraphQL properly, um, you need more abstractions on top of it. Um, and that's, these are not like abstractions that GraphQL comes with. These are abstractions that um, you, you create to add a layer of business logic, for example, or like a ACL layer, like a control layer. Um, traditionally, in REST API, you would use, um, like the, you would have an, some kind of ACL package or ACL layer where that actually protects the endpoint. In GraphQL, there's many endpoints. So that's, that's actually very different. Um, so because of that reason, the, end, the, the, the excess control actually has to happen in resolvers. And the best way to do that is to introduce another abstraction for uh, models. Uh, models is actually the best way to uh, fully utilize GraphQL. OK. Um, so I already talked about that, connectors. And the connectors, uh, lastly, is, a, is basically like a database connector. You could actually, it's actually possible to use both like NoSQL and MySQL at the same time um, by having two connectors and then calling the data from other places. And in your resolvers, uh, you just use the data together. OK. Um, the last thing I was going to talk about models is actually um, the more advanced um, idea and the most important thing, in my opinion, in um, GraphQL. Um, I was actually going to go through this article, which actually explains it pretty well. Uh, but I think I'm running out of time. So I, uh, this, um, the problem with GraphQL is that it's so new. Uh, it's actually hard to um, find everything about the best example. For example, I don't think I found a good example of how to 
properly create a GraphQL model. Um, I found like snippets, I found this article very useful. It talks about how Facebook uses uh, GraphQL. And this conference was actually very useful because uh, Facebook created GraphQL in case you didn't know. Um, so models are basically things like, like you know, defining things like this. To do I can only be seen by a creator. And here, I'm talking, I talked earlier about business logic layer and storage layer. You want to create your own abstractions to fully utilize GraphQL. And here's a simple example of a model that they created um, where you have a to-do item that's a model. Um, there you, would want, you would want to have a model for every data type, for example. Yeah. Um, OK, should I keep going or? Yeah. No, yeah, OK. OK, so that's GraphQL. So, um, would anyone like to come up?